series for the year. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of the different talks that we're, uh, we plan for the semester. Um, they're really exciting, starting with Pavo's talk today on land use regulations. Um, there are other talks on housing and kind of larger processes of urbanization, including Devin Michelle Bunton, who's going to be talking about how neighborhoods are made gentrifiable, and Richard Rothstein is coming. Um, he's going to be talking about his book, The Color of Law, Redlining, and Home uh, Mortgage Discrimination uh, in the U.S., um, and that's going to be on a Monday, which I should note that, and Michael will also, um, when he sends out the reminder for that, uh, for that lecture, remind you guys that it's on a Monday rather than uh, the regular LIPS Tuesdays. And then there's going to be a lot of talks on maps and spatial data. Um, in particular, collaborative mapping processes. Um, Shannon Mattern is giving a talk on map washing. Shin Pei Se is going to be talking about um, collecting information and data on how we use public space and how to create, and how to create those into maps. Um, Erin McElroy and the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. Uh, she's coming to talk about um, how, how the ethics around data collection, um, uh, eviction data collection. Um, what else? Uh, spatial data. Seth Spielman is going to be talking about data and data misinformation in urban planning. Levi Wolf is going to be talking about understanding the, spatial, understanding the boundaries of sa uh, spatial segregation. And then lastly but not least, um, we have our tripartite uh, book panel featuring um, Lance, our very own Lance Freeman, um, Shanette Garrett-Scott, and Elizabeth Herbin-Trent. Um, we're calling the panel the double-edgedness, uh, double-edgedness, uh, black life, white supremacy, and property finance and the city. Um, so very exciting talks this semester. And with that, I... Uh, Welcome and introduce Pavel Monkonen, who is an associate professor at the UCLA uh, Luskin School of Public Policy. Please. Right. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Good? I'm doing great. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here um, in New York. Uh, thanks so much for thinking to invite me to this and for kind of to everyone who helped make the uh, trip very easy and enjoyable so far. Um, thanks to Bloomberg for putting in all the bike lanes. Um, people complain that they're not that good, but compared to LA, they're like heaven. Uh, incidentally, this is my first visit to Columbia, which is a quite nice place, so that's nice. I actually only applied to Berkeley and Columbia as an undergrad um, and didn't get in here, so ha, now I'm here. Take that. Um, before I start, I'll just ask, how many people here have been to California before? Well, I guess, how many people haven't been to California before? You don't have to go. It's not that important. I just wanted to make sure everyone has some sense of context, kind of the contrast between uh, an old industrial, uh, dense uh, northeastern city and what, we're talking, what I'm talking about today in California, where five stories is usually called a tower by many people, right? In fact, one of our local council members from the city of LA called five, a five-story project turning the neighborhood into Dubai. So that's uh, kind of what we're talking about in terms of height uh, here. I'm going to be talking about research with two colleagues, uh, Michael Manville and Michael Lenz. Um, they both send their regards. Uh, we apologize, we don't have a finished working paper yet, but we almost do. Um, so if you want it uh, in a couple weeks, let me know and I'll, and I'll share it with you. Um, I think we're getting somewhere interesting in this kind of subfield of research on land use regulation and housing markets, which has been going on for several decades, um, but I think still needs uh, work and nuance. Um, our original research question was to distinguish two kinds of regulation that are often lumped together, which is kind of regulation of process, so how hard it is to get projects approved, compared to regulation of kind of prohibitions, uh, what you can even propose on a site in the first place. Uh, so our hunch was that the prohibition type of regulation was much, much more consequential for the housing shortage in California and the, the housing crisis there. To, to spoil the conclusion a bit, um, I'll just say that during the course of our work, we realized that something that's been missing from this subfield is a focus on built-outness of cities, right? So there has been a lot of measurement of different kinds of prohibitions, uh, of, of building, but not enough consideration of what already exists in a city. So our emerging argument is that it's actually a lack of what we call zoned capacity, 
uh, idea that I'll talk about later, which is a combination of the prohibitions of what can be built as well as what's already there in a city. Um, it's this idea of zone capacity and a lack of zone capacity, especially in high demand parts of cities or in high demand cities themselves, um, that's kind of the main, one of the major, the main roots of uh, our housing shortage. So we get to this conclusion using a new data source uh, on zone capacity that we've carefully harvested from cities' general plans. Um, it's, it's like a nicely timed moment of research synergy. There's a couple good papers out right now talking about surveys of land use regulation and all the problems that using these survey data uh, entail. Um, and at the same time, we've got this other data source that's not surveys. So that's, that's nice. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. And in the end, I'm going to conclude with, with kind of a challenge for the planning field. Um, I think there's an ideological tension among planners uh, where on the one hand, we have this idea of the growth machine as bad. And then that gives us, that gives pass to kind of the slow growth movement as being something that's kind of okay and we don't really worry about too much. And I'm going to argue that the slow growth movement in California uh, has caused a lot of problems, right? And especially caused a lot of problems for low-income households who are actually on net leaving the state. Okay, so towers. Last year, a uh, developer got permit to build a 250-unit uh, project, a pretty mundane apart set of apartment buildings in Santa Monica, California. Um, they're already under construction now. Um, this permission took five years to negotiate with the city of Santa Monica. We're trying to get a full page count of all the planning documents that they had to, to uh, issue in order to get this permitted. Uh, the environmental impact report itself was 650 pages long. So in order to get the permission to build this uh, project, it's a redevelopment of a uh, former department store in Santa Monica. They made it lead platinum. They favored local residents in hiring. They limited the number of afternoon peak period vehicle trips. They paid a fee to the city for every trip that exceeded those limits. They built four uh, level deep basement parking, uh, 200 car parking, a community meeting space. They bought and entitled, entitled a separate piece of land to build affordable housing on. Um, right, so this long series of process uh, kinds of regulations that they, that they negotiated, and this is what many people think about when they think about the kind of very regulated building environment uh, in, in California. Let's go 70 miles south to the city of Rancho Santa Margarita uh, in Orange County. Uh, it's a master plan city adjacent to the giant marine base Camp Pendleton. Um, it is an emblematic of a built out city. According to the city's general plan, it only has space for 12 units left, right? It's almost totally built out. But on an index of land use regulation, it scores very low. So apparently, it has a very low level of regulation, but it is not adding uh, much new housing. I don't have time to do full justice to Beverly Hills, but I just want to say that it's kind of emblematic of another kind of city that combines kind of this built outness as well as pretty high procedural regulations. In addition, it, it's a city, uh, like, like many cities in, in California, that is adding a lot of high paying jobs and is basically stagnant in terms of the amount of housing it's added since I was born, right? So it hasn't grown by people, but it's grown by jobs and now has five times as many jobs as houses. So we've got these three kinds of expensive cities that don't build much housing. Uh, but they don't build much housing in different ways, right? So some of them, like Santa Monica, have space left in theory, but each project is this complex, negotiated, onerous uh, process to get it built. And some other cities have very easy rules to get things built, but there's no space left. So perhaps it's not surprising that we're the least building of housing state in the country, second to least. But you wouldn't think that from talking to people in Los Angeles, for example, where frequently people talk about the building boom, right? Because they see one building being built near them. Um, it's amazing. We're actually building a third less than we did in the 70s and 80s, kind of other periods of building booms. Uh, these are not totally updated, but don't worry. It hasn't gotten much higher than uh, 100,000 in recent years. In fact, in 2019, on average, we're building less than we did in 2018. All of California? This is all of California. This is all of California. But LA is similar. 
Okay. So today I'm going to talk, I've already talked about how California is bananas. I'm going to talk about the motivation and contributions of, of our paper, a little bit about the literature on land use regulations and housing markets, our analysis. I have two cool graphs at the end. They're very exciting. I'm very excited about them. And then I'll end with some conclusions about uh, what can be done and kind of challenges for the planning scholarship and planners active out there in terms of, of uh, getting housing built in expensive neighborhoods. Okay, so we had a kind of policy motivation. I'm not sure how aware you are of uh, California's housing politics, but it's fast and furious, right? We're arguing all the time about what to be done. Um, there's some ambitious proposals that have basically come to nothing uh, to date. We're really building a lot of ADUs. People love uh, granny flats and backyard cottages because they're kind of the least offensive uh, seeming solution to this situation. Um, LA is very excited that last year it permitted something like 4,000 or 5,000 accessory dwelling units in a city of 4 million, uh, right? And zoning reform kind of notably top down, right? State level zoning reform that says cities were taking away your zoning powers uh, near train stations and we're gonna allow four story, five story buildings to be built has kind of caused a lot of controversy there. So there's this, this policy motivation, but there's also an academic motivation kind of to push forward this, this subfield on land use regulations and housing markets um, in three ways, right? One is figuring out which are the regulations that matter the most. Two is where do they matter, right? So we have a lot of uh, zone capacity in the desert cities, kind of out near Palm Springs, but it's not being built. So regulatory reform there probably doesn't matter. Um, and the third one is what can we expect under different kinds of zoning reform? So we're at this interesting turning point, I think, in American urban history where we have mostly built out cities. Uh, we don't have a lot of vacant land left. And we're at this point where we need to maybe think about zoning reform uh, and adding multifamily buildings in single family neighborhoods is something we've never really done, even though it's kind of from a top down perspective, the most obvious and beneficial way to add housing uh, to a city, right? But we've never done it, so we don't have models to tell people, don't worry, the sky won't fall when we do this because it's, it's just not been done. Uh, the other motivation was that we got some funding from the UC Berkeley Turner Center. So thank you, UC Berkeley Turner Center. Um, and the funding was part of an effort to have scholars use their new survey of land use regulations in California. So as I mentioned earlier, so we use that survey, but as I mentioned earlier, I think the data that we harvested from cities general plans is, is much more uh, beneficial for this, for this work. Okay, so I'll show some covers of this source of this uh, zone capacity data that we've harvested. The city of Encinitas, I like it because it's just like ultimate California, California kitsch. And I think it's, I mean, it's cute, but it's kind of important too, because as I mentioned, this kind of slow growth, kind of hippie environmentalist mentality seems quite nice and kind of, we kind of agree with the idea of it. Um, but unfortunately, I think it has severe negative outcomes for, uh, especially for low income families and environmental sustainability kind of in a big picture. So. We can appreciate it. They, in the 2015, they had people on it, and then in the 2016 revised, they didn't. I don't know what happened. <laughs> the state of California has a, this thing called a housing element law, starting in 1969. And I'll give you the short version. Every eight years, the state government, along with councils of governments, which are kind of regional bodies of, of municipalities, they project population growth, they project household formation, and then they have a number that's the housing need based on that projected household formation that we must accommodate in our zoning, right? So then the regional governments give each city a kind of housing production target. They don't, it's technically not a housing production target, but people view it as one. So they say, this city, you need to zone to accommodate growth of a thousand households, right? So they do this every eight years and the cities must revise their, their housing elements of their general plan and send them to the state to be approved. Um, they do this also by income level. So they, you, not only must you zone for 1,000 new housing units, 250 of those must be for low-income housing units. What they really mean is 250 of those must be in some kind of high density, California high density, over 20 units per acre, right? So they've created this idea of a zone capacity, and they tell cities, you must have some amount of zone capacity to accommodate future growth. I use the example from the city of Martinez because it's a clear example, right? So in the green part, 
what the city of Martinez has done is done a sites inventory, right? So they've gone through all the parcels in their city and they've said, look, we've got all these vacant parcels. They can accommodate 500 units. We've got these underutilized parcels zoned for housing. They can accommodate another 500 units. And we've got some potential redevelopable, you know, mixed use parcels or whatever. And together, they, they cumulatively have, we cumulatively have a space for 1,156 new units. Right? And that is more, right? the red section is what the regional government has told them the number of housing units they must accommodate in their zoning. Right? So the regional government says, you have to have space for 469 new units. And the city says, look, we have space for 1,156. Therefore, we meet our RENA, our regional housing needs goals. This seems like a good idea, right? It seems like a kind of way to do some top-down standards with some local input. They decide where they put the new housing. Um, the state says you need to accommodate for some new growth. They, they figure it out. It's kind of this balance of, of state priorities and local control. Two problems with this system to date. One problem is that there was basically no punishment for not complying and no reward for complying. So many, many cities were totally out of compliance. That's bad. Second problem is the way they decided on what a city's uh, housing goals would be was this totally perverted uh, political process. Basically, they asked every city, how much housing do you think you're going to add in the next eight years? And they say, I don't know, this much? And then they turn around and give them that number as their goal. So the city of Beverly Hills famously got a RENA goal of two. <laughs> Over eight years, Beverly Hills had to add two units, and they did very well. They added more than two units. Uh, at the same time, the city of Coachella, which is in the Coachella Valley, you might have heard of it, um, it's about the same size, they got a housing goal of like 1,500, because they said, yeah, we're going to probably add 1,500 houses on all this vacant land we have sitting here. So the regional goals were allocated in this perverse kind of more to the sprawling poor areas uh, at the edges of the, of the region. The state fortunately has reformed this law kind of with two other laws in the recent years. Um, one is to create some kind of punishment. So now we have something like a Massachusetts 40B system where if the cities are not meeting their goals, then developers can get a buy right uh, permission to build things that, buildings that have some affordable rights, kind of complicated. Uh, basically, they can get, uh, they can avoid some of the discretionary planning reviews if they're going to build uh, housing that has some affordable set asides. So there's some kind of punishment, although it's not really a punishment to build housing, actually. Um, there's some kind of punishment. And not only that, currently, uh, last year a law was passed to do the allocation of housing units within regions to cities in a better way, in a way informed by kind of measurable standards of sustainability and social equity, et cetera. And that's what I've spent most of the summer uh, doing in the regional committee uh, for Southern California on this housing needs allocation. It's been a very enlightening uh, experience to learn how bureaucracy uh, at the regional level in California does not work. If you want to get involved, let me know. I'll tell you. I'll send you more information. You can still send public comments. OK. So moving to the academic field of research, uh, looking at the impacts of land use regulation on housing markets, um, I'm going to talk about three dimensions quickly. One is the geographic scale of this work. One is kind of the basic theory. Uh, and Sorry, that's two. And three is how scholars measure land use regulations. So these are the cities of Southern California by population size. Um, there's this tension in the study of how land use regulations impact housing markets because land use regulations in the United States are carried out by municipalities. But housing markets operate at the regional level, right? So housing markets don't respect municipal boundaries within a metropolitan area. Housing markets are labor markets, right? They're metropolitan. So. I won't talk about that more. So here's, I'll give you the basic theory, right? So you've been seeing this before, perhaps. It's the supply and demand curve, uh, right? So we have the price on the y-axis, the quantity on the x-axis, the downward sloping demand curve. Um, the impact of land use regulations on housing markets is always predicated by an increase in demand, right? It's always conditional on an increase in demand. So we have demand at time zero, and then we have in the city an increase in population or an increase in incomes or a combination of both and we see the demand curve shift outwards and what happens in this unregulated Atlanta or Houston right it's this is a very simplified version of it right obviously there's no unregulated city uh, we have the demand curve shift outward people move to the place 
the quantity of housing increases by a lot, the price of housing increases by a little bit. Now, if we contrast that with a San Francisco or a Los Angeles, we have a more regulated city because of the complex complexity of production, because of the lack of land zone for multifamily, right? We have the same demand shift, right, happening. So the same amount of people or, or incomes going up uh, happening. We have a little bit of quantity increase and a lot of price increase. All right, so this is the basic kind of theory underlying uh, how people look at this. One interesting thing that in this body of research is that there's a lot of work looking at the price impacts. I mean, they're, they happen at the same time effectively, right, because it's a two equation system. But there's a lot less work using uh, output or permits or new housing as the dependent variable in the empirical analysis. There's something like 13 papers, right? So I think it's interesting. I mean, obviously, price is what we care about the most. We don't really care about quantity going up it, it, independent of, of price changes. Um, but it's interesting because the impacts of regulation on quantity is to make them go up by less. The impacts of regulation on price is to make it go up by even more. So I think to some extent, there's a, you get an easier measurement uh, when you look at quantity. And actually, doing both, I think, would be the right, the right thing to do. So as I said, there's, there are uh, over 100 papers on this topic, kind of the upshot of this body of work, uh, mostly by economists, but also by planners, is that there is a strong correlation between regulations, right? The, the basic model seems to be true in the empirical reality, right? So cities that are more highly regulated have higher rents, their rents are going up by more, et cetera, than cities um, that are less heavily regulated. We can talk maybe in the Q&A if you want to talk about uh, kind of the endogeneity issues, right? This is obviously a correlation, and if you learn, if you remember one thing today, correlation is not causation, right? So there are potential concerns where uh, if a city is adding a lot of new housing, they're going to regulate more, right? So you might see more regulated cities uh, be producing more, as, as we'll see later, uh, because of this endogeneity. Okay, so quickly on to the measurement challenges. So land use regulations are a complex, multifaceted thing, right? And so how people have tried to measure them is important. Um, it is a big challenge, right? So one way that people often have tried to measure them and synthesize them into one number is through an index composed of many kinds of uh, aspects of regulation. So combining these kind of process elements with these prohibition elements doing a factor analysis and getting a number. San Francisco's five, uh, Rancho Santa Margarita's three, and Rancho, uh, the Coachella is minus two, right? So you have this kind of one number that summarizes the city's uh, land use regulation environment. Uh, this is a problem, as I may, you may already be thinking why this is a problem. There are a number of places where with one regulation, you can block all development, right? So Rancho Santa Margarita has a very low score on this index but it's full, it has one zoning rule, right? The minimum lot size is one acre, and you can't build anything more, right? So it's gonna to appear to be low regulated, but it's gonna have very high prices and low production. Similarly, the city of Berkeley was a great example because uh, that progressive city that it is, it shows up as a very low regulated city, but it has a city council that likes to block things, right? So it has a very dis heavily discretionary process um, that allows it to prevent production. So, okay, the second challenge is that a lot of, the second challenge is we don't have a good objective database on land use regulations in the United States, right? So cities regulate land use, cities all have different zoning codes, their development standards are different, they use different words to mean the same thing, right? And, and no federal government has ever attempted to get kind of one synthesized set of measures for cities, um, and that's a big problem. So what researchers do is they use surveys, right? And survey data are, maybe we shouldn't be surprised, but I was surprised to see these two recent papers just show just how bad they are. So this is a forthcoming paper in Jabba from Paul Lewis and Nick Morantz, and they found, so California has had eight or nine surveys of land use regulation done over the last 30 years, um, and they're very inconsistent. So the most, I found the most egregious example, so they found in 1988 two different groups of researchers surveyed the same set of cities about their land use regulations. According to one survey, nine cities said, yes, we have urban growth boundaries. According to the other s survey, five cities said, yes, we have growth boundaries. 
but no, those were different cities, right? So the nine cities that replied to that survey, we have group urban growth boundaries, to the other, other survey replied no. And the five cities that replied no replied yes to the other survey, right? So there's like very inconsistent responses from planners uh, in these survey data, unfortunately. Uh, another working paper funded by the UC Berkeley Turner Center uh, recently out, authored by some fantastic Columbia scholars, Moira O'Neill, Julia Guelco Nelson, and some other guy from Berkeley. Uh, it does a really good uh, uh, treatment on understanding the issues with survey data because it ground truths some of the survey responses uh, using case studies and actual data on project entitlements. Right, so one of the question, a set of the questions in the survey data is how long does it take to get something approved under this line of approval? How long does it take to get something approved on a different line of approval? And so these researchers uh, have gone to those cities, gotten all the approval histories of all the different projects, and added up actually how long it took in that city to get something approved. And I guess not surprisingly, in most places, it took much longer in reality on average to get something approved than the planners responding to the survey thought it did, right? So the planners said, I don't know, it takes five months. And then they look in the data, no, it actually takes a year and a half, right? So there's this actual uh, incorrect element to a lot of the survey data. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, our original plan was to create kind of two indexes, right? So to look at the regulation of process and the regulation, kind of these prohibition regulations and to assess which would, and to kind of distinguish their effects on housing production and to assess which one had a larger effect. So we set about that plan by looking, by creating a process index and a prohibition index, right? The process index, uh, we kind of added up questions in this Turner survey about the, how discretionary our reviews for projects uh, how, many, how much delay is there? How important are impact fees? What are kind of fees for building a, to get a permit to build a multifamily project, et cetera? Now with this process index, it's, it's quite illuminating because first of all, there were a lot of missing answers. So for example, with impact fees, something almost half of the cities surveyed by the Turner Center didn't give an actual number for an impact fee. So we couldn't use that in our index. Instead, what we could use was a planner responding to the survey's subjective opinion about are impact fees a problem, a constraint to development in your city? One to five, right? So for a lot of these process index questions, they're basically a planner's subjective opinion about whether this is a constraint to development in their city. Now this is, a, this is an issue. Uh, this lack of an objective measure is an issue. Because you can think about low demand cities where there aren't very many applications to build. And you ask a planner in that low demand city, are impact fees a constraint to development in your city? No, they're not, right? The constraint to development in my city is no one wants to build housing in my city. You ask a planner in Santa Monica, are constraints to development a problem in your city? Or sorry, impact fees a constraint to development in your city? They say, yes, it is. Right, so there's going to be this endogenous correlation between places where there's actually a lot of applications to build and then high rankings on these subjective questions about is this a constraint to development in your city? And that's actually some, I mean, that's what we see in the data. So the process index, I mean, I think it's an interesting research exercise. It ultimately is not telling us whether process is a constraint to development in the city. The prohibition index, on the other hand, is, on the other hand, is actual objective measured. So what are the height restrictions? What are setbacks? What's FAR? What's parking requirements, et cetera? And fortunately for us, there were also missing uh, data in the Turner survey, but uh, like this is research synergy across the country in many ways, right? Uh, Salim Firth and Olivia Gonzalez um, had done something exact that had created a prohibition index um, just as we set out to do before we did it. And not only that, they filled in the missing blanks by looking at city's general plans. Like, so if the city didn't report its height restriction in the survey, they went in their general plan and got the height restriction in their survey, right? So we have a really good complete prohibition index and a really bad and complete process index. So far, I guess we can amend it later. So we, there's about 480 cities in, in California. We exclude kind of the non, the very rural non-metropolitan ones. Uh, 
we have zoned capacity data are from these housing elements that we've harvested. We have that for almost all of them. The prohibition index, the Turner survey was about 240 cities. Uh, we have this prohibition index for about 230 cities, and we have the process index for, for almost 200 cities. I guess I'll just note that greater LA is really big. Basically, it's half the state in terms of population, and underrepresented in the state government because it's far away, as the, as the theory goes. Okay, so when we start analyzing the data, uh, first thing to note is there is a high correlation between process, prohibition, uh, and housing costs, right? So expensive cities have higher rankings on this process index, expensive cities have higher rankings on this prohibition index, and expensive cities have less zoned capacity, right? So the prohibition and zone capacity, right? Zone capacity is bigger if there's more space left, right? So it's a negative correlation with housing costs, right? So the expensive cities are more likely to be built out. So the second thing to note is that the correlation in the case of prohibitions and zone capacity flips when it comes to production, right? So more expensive cities are more prohibitive, but more prohibitive cities build less housing, right? Kind of that's what the economic model that I showed you earlier would predict. Uh, on the other hand, process cities, cities that score high on the process index build more housing, right? And I think what we're seeing here is actually kind of a reverse causation where building a lot of housing makes cities have more process index and this is where you need to do some more statistics to get beyond what are here simple kind of bivariate correlations. So we haven't done the fancier statistics yet. Um, right now we're just doing a simple naive uh, regression model right that's controlling for rents uh, and some other city characteristics, density, jobs, access, these other things, um, in order to test kind of what are the relationships between these regulatory indexes and housing construction uh, in these different cities. Later we will do what's called, what are called instrumental variable models where we um, look at things that are correlated with the regulations but not with production. Kind of past voting records on Prop 13 is something we're gonna use, right? The, the problem is nobody really believes instrumental variable models, and they're really hard to do. It's really hard to find an instrument that's good, but that's, that's our plan uh, so far. If you have a better suggestion for us, we're open to it. So these are the early uh, results of our regression models. Uh, basically, so we're looking at two columns for each index, for each treatment, right? So we look at two different outcomes. One is how many overall permits did the city do? between 2013 and 2017, and how many multifamily permits did the city uh, grant within that same time period, right? And to look at uh, how these different variables affect or are correlated with uh, this production of housing. So we see that, not surprisingly, big, bigger cities build more. I mean, basically, population size is just a control variable, although, yeah, population size is just a control variable. Um, higher rent cities add more overall permits. But surprisingly, and this is kind of one of these strange counterintuitive California-specific situations, cities with higher rents don't add more multifamily housing, right? So you think if you're a developer, you go to where the rents are high, you build some housing, you make a lot of money. That's not what's happening with multifamily housing in California, and the, the idea is this is our unique condition um, uh, and indication that something is wrong, right, with the housing development process there. Um, I would be more worried about this, uh, but so there's actually another UC Berkeley Turner Center funded paper by some great scholars at Brookings, Cecile Murray and Jenny Schutz. Um, Turner funded two projects that were quite similar. So their paper is kind of how do regulations constrain production of apartments in California. Uh, and so they look at that specifically and they find the same result. So in terms of regulation, we see, uh, as we saw in the simple kind of not controlled by very correlations, that cities that build more multifamily uh, buildings uh, have higher process index. Uh, but we see that the role of prohibitions and the role of zone capacity is kind of as theory would predict, right? So cities that are more regulated in terms of what can be built in the city um, have lower production. And cities that have less zone capacity, right, so less space left, produce a lot less housing. So kind of a 10% increase 
in uh, zone capacity uh, results in a 3% increase in housing production, right? So that's the positive correlation because basically it's saying cities with more zone capacity build more housing, right? So cities with less zone capacity build less housing. And actually I didn't put the results here, but if you include these three measures of regulation in the same model, uh, the process and the prohibition indexes lose significance and really it's the zone capacity that dominates, which makes sense, right? Because zone capacity kind of captures this prohibition sense as well as what exists there already. I'll just note, so the prohibition number looks bigger, but it's actually kind of a different scale because the zone capacity is the log of zone capacity. The prohibition index is this index that goes from minus two to minus four. So I did their marginal effects kind of on, the, on graphs next to each other. And we can see that their effects are, are pretty similar, right? So this shows kind of as you increase zone capacity, uh, you increase multifamily production. As you increase restrictiveness, sorry, as you, in, in, you decrease restrictiveness, I change the sign, right? You increase production. <coughs> okay, are you bored of statistics yet? I'm glad to hear that because I got my favorite statistics ever. Uh, <laughs> so this is called a contour plot and I'll explain it. Um, I mentioned that one of the areas of this subfield that studies land use regulations and housing market, one of the areas where they haven't done enough work, and in my opinion, is kind of where changing the regulations matters more, right? So in the previous models, what they were telling us kind of controlling for rents they were saying, for a city with a given rent, how does production change as zone capacity changes, right? But I was kind of hinting at and hypothesizing based on evidence that in high rent cities, zone more zone capacity is gonna have a bigger effect than it would in low rent cities, right? So I ran the same kind of model with an interaction term, right? And so I interacted rents and zone capacity. So these colors tell us how much permitting we expect to see uh, for different levels of rents and different levels of zone capacity interacted with one another, right? So at low levels of rents, zone capacity doesn't affect, right? You go up and down on the zone capacity variable, you don't get much more housing production. But at high levels of rents, you add more zone capacity, you get a lot more housing production, right? And so this is something that I observe actually just on descriptive data in Southern California, right? There's a lot of zone capacity in Palmdale. Palmdale has a ton of space left, right? There's this city called California City that's really out in the middle of nowhere. It has like, you know, 100,000 entitled lots ready to build, right? And in Beverly Hills, there's 700 spaces left, right? And if we added more spaces in Beverly Hills, they would probably get built. Um, so these are logs. I did the math, so if you think about on the left side of this, kind of going up and down, adding more zone capacity in low rent cities, you go from 100 permits to 150 permits. Adding more zone capacity in the expensive cities, you go from 100 permits to 1,500 permits, right? So it's an order of magnitude difference in terms of production uh, there. The effect is a little smaller for, for multifamily, right? This is the multifamily, uh, same thing. Um, I'm not doing on time. Good. <clears throat> so you go from 20 to 30 on the low rents, and you go from 20 to 180 on the high rents. Okay. I think I have time to explain this a little bit. So I mentioned I'm on this regional uh, committee about allocating housing demand under state law. And one thing I did to illustrate this fact, kind of, I didn't, I actually did share this with the local electeds that make up this regional government, but I thought I would do a simpler version uh, for myself as well, right? And so what I did is I ranked the cities in Southern, the 190 cities in Southern California by rents, and then I made kind of quartiles by population. So like four groups of cities of the same population size ordered by rents, right? So the lowest rent cities, the next lowest rent cities, the higher rent cities, and the highest rent cities. Just to look at our situation in terms of how much space zone capacity we have in those cities uh, and how much production actually happens in those cities. And what we see, kind of the basic summary is, we have a lot of zone capacity in the inexpensive cities, but we actually build a lot more housing in the expensive cities, in spite of the fact that 
we don't have a lot of zone capacity. Right? Does that make sense? So this shows kind of the percentage of zone capacity in the lower rent cities is almost well over 50, right? The percentage of zone capacity in these uh, expensive cities is about 20% of the kind of regional total. Whereas the multifamily per permitting, right? Something like 45% of the permitting is happening in the expensive cities uh, and less than 10% of the permitting is happening in the cheaper cities. And just for fun, I took LA out, right? So Southern California is 20 million people. The city of LA is 4 million people. And the city of LA is a real outlier. So actually, here's the city of LA. Uh, the city of LA was like half of the permits in the state of California last month, right? So the city of LA really adds a lot of housing compared to the other places in the, the state. It doesn't really add a lot of housing. Um, and the problem with there's this, this kind of damning statistic about what kind of housing is being built in, the LA, in LA right now. So somebody looked at the permits from last month. Half of the permits were accessory dwelling units. The other half of the permits were in five projects. Two of them were 100% affordable, five big projects, right? So five 200 unit plus projects. Two of them were 100% affordable. One of them was senior living. Uh, assisted living, and the other two were like luxury towers in downtown, right? So we, we're in the situation where we're, we're, we have the kind of zone capacity we have left is the wrong kind of zone capacity in some sense. We have space for really tall, expensive buildings or backyard granny flats. We don't have any space for like the most simple to build four-story uh, stick uh, kind of apartment buildings, right? And so that's kind of the big argument in California is how do we change the zoning to allow mundane apartments that everyone in New York lives in. Well, not, you know what I mean. Okay, so I'm preempting my conclusions. Uh, is it cool to use what is to be done? Who said that? Right. Lennon. I think it was Lennon. I don't know. I guess, I guess nobody knows it is Lennon, so it's, it's okay. I like it. What is to be done? Um, I think, as I said, we're kind of at a turning point, at least in California, but I think in the United States, of this challenge of kind of how do we add multifamily housing into single-family neighborhoods. It's the most obvious way to do this, um, short of decommodifying housing completely and overthrowing capitalism, which would be fine. But in the meantime, I think adding six plexes in single-family neighborhoods is kind of cheap to build. You know, the cheapest to build, this is from Portland. Portland adds these things. They have no parking. They're great, they're way cheaper than the single family luxury house next door, right? So one of my pet peeves of the planning profession is the idea of a residential neighborhood. I don't think that's a problem in New York probably, but where I come from, every city's general plan says, here's what we're gonna do. Growth in the corridors and centers protect the residential neighborhoods, right? Growth of apartments that are houses that are residential over there, the residential neighborhoods, link, we're gonna protect them, right? And I think it's a big problem and I think every planner should be calling it out all the time, right? I think no city should have, in America, should have single family low density zoning. Uh, we have a JAPA commentary coming out, Manville, Lenz and I, to this effect. That's, that's pretty good, check it out. It's coming soon. Um, so you're probably already thinking about concerns with gentrification and displacement. And I think those are crucial, right? And I think they need, those kinds of concerns should be baked into any upzoning program, um, strong demolition controls, uh, tenant protections, et cetera. Uh, I think SB 50 in California has gotten there pretty well. But I think kind of the important takeaway from this graph is that if we just increase zone capacity everywhere, the building isn't gonna happen in the poor neighborhoods. The building is gonna happen in Beverly Hills, right? If you could build sixplexes in Beverly Hills, you would, right, if you're a developer. In fact, in LA, you know, kind of some of the debates about increasing uh, allowed density near transit, we looked at kind of unbuilt capacity, and there's a lot of unbuilt capacity in the low-income parts of the city, right? So the developers want to build where they can make money. If we let them do that, they will. Uh, and if we don't do that, right, in the down-zoned world, in a static zoning world kind of that's totally built out, um, rich people are going to live where they're going to want to live, right? I mean, they're not, you're not protecting necessarily uh, low-income households against gentrification by not building, right? So a lot of the gentrification in L.A. is it's parts of the city that didn't build any housing. It's just working-class, single-family houses that rich people couldn't find 
uh, housing near where they work, so they go to the next neighborhood over, uh, they push those people out, they go to the next neighborhood over, they push those people out. Right? So the, I think the downzoned, statically zoned city is uh, an unjust city. Not only that, I consider myself a progressive and a big advocate for progressive housing policies. Increasing allowed densities is very complementary to the other progressive housing policies, right? So subsidies to build multifamily subsidized housing go much farther when there are a ton of multifamily parcels where you can build. Right now, affordable developers are competing with for-profit developers for the same land and paying tons of money for that land, right? If you could build it anywhere, it would be much cheaper to buy it to build it, right? So these are kind of complementary uh, to progressive policies. And maybe uh, this, it's not a fully formed thought yet, but I think, you know, so extracting as much as we can from every development project is a problem, is not progressive. I think what's progressive is taxing the rich and redistributing that to the poor, right? But we've kind of convinced ourselves that like, well, this is the best thing we can do in Santa, like Santa Monicans are very proud of the Fred Siegel redevelopment because they got childcare money, they got you know, an affordable building, they got this stuff, they got this stuff. Um, they're not taxing the rich people of Santa Monica. Do, you know, most, 96% of the rich people in Santa Monica paid nothing into that, right? The people that are gonna be living in that mundane seven-story building in Santa Monica are well-off people, but they're not the actually rich people of Santa Monica. Okay, so another thing we wrote, the Mikes and I, uh, was a response to this uh, article by our colleague Michael Storper and his colleague at LSC, uh, Rodriguez Pose. You might have seen this uh, City Lab piece by Richard Florida um, that all the NIMBYs love and are waving it around saying, evidence by eminent scholars that in fact, upzoning is bad. Um, in fact, the mayor of Beverly Hills, who hates me with a passion, he's, if you want to see a two-page letter he wrote about how I should be kicked off the regional planning committee, I could share that with you, he calls it urban supremacism, right? The, the state would dare force Beverly Hills to have apartment buildings near train stations. Uh, you know, I can, I'll, if you're interested in, we, so we wrote a rebuttal, we have a better version of the rebuttal, Submitted to Urban Studies now, so hopefully you can read that in the in the presses. I'd be happy to share it to you, with you earlier. Um, basically, you know, their kind of main argument is that increase allowing more dense. I mean, they kind of admit if we just upzone everywhere, they're gonna the developers will just build in the expensive neighborhoods, and then like rich people will live in those houses, and like that's not that's not good. And our counter argument is yeah, actually that's good, right? Because if we don't allow that to happen then rich people are gonna live uh, in the places they can, which are the lower, you know, the older houses, and they're gonna price out the poorer families, right? So then they say that's not gonna happen because it's housing submarkets. Have you heard about housing submarkets, right? So within a metropolitan area, there's all these different submarkets. And those submarkets are kind of impermeable, right? So there's only this submarket that, that poor people operate in, and this submarket that middle income, and this submarket. But that's not true, right? Housing submarkets exist, but they are permeable. So when the city I'm from, Culver City, has Amazon Studios come in and get some 500 new high paying jobs, there's no more houses in Culver City, they're all full. So those employees are gonna move east to Lamert Park and the people that were gonna live in Lamert Park are gonna move east to you know, West Adams and the people that were gonna live in West Adams are gonna move east and we're pushing people out kind of to the edge of the city, right? And that's, that's, that's bad. Thanks. So like for cities like Palo Alto, mm -hmm. like why do they only why is it only law only less than build two floors? Why like you know what I mean? Like for city yeah. like that in Silicon Valley it's makes sense that why they don't have laws of that. Doesn't make sense. Uh, so I think it's why are the zoning laws what they are, I think is a combination of kind of history and a static view of zoning. So they built out the city at a density that made sense maybe for the time, right? Single family zoning back in the day, as professors of history can tell us, often was connected to kind of racist, classist, exclusionary goals of the time. And that was, you know, whatever, 60, 70 years ago. And I think upzoning is a real challenge for people because change is hard, 
and people like the status quo, and people are worried about a lot of different things happening if they allowed more housing in their neighborhoods. But I think if you were going to start fresh, you would do it at a much different density given kind of the economic geography of the city. I mean, to some extent, it's inevitable if you think about landmark, like demand for housing at different distances to jobs over time, right? So at one point in time, this parcel of land makes sense to build a single family house there, but then the region has grown 50 times since you built it. Now it makes sense to have a 10 story building there, right? Community centers to house the homeless people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the way that the homeless people are like affected by changing the zone. Yeah, there are a lot of inconsistencies. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I really appreciate the focus on kind of the, the, the OT poor stories of units. I think that's something that housing scholars forget about a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's such an area of potential affordability. Right. In most cities. Where, where and when do developers can be incentivized to go forward with those and how this does in practice mean more about right. the human rights space? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Perceptions of different framings about density to change people's answers. So I'm wondering not just what next in terms of science, but what next in terms of where we would be in discourse, California politics, et cetera. And then secondly, talked about process, but you didn't really talk about the process in vis a vis the prohibitions. Uh huh. Okay. Right. How how might not how long can we get process and prohibitions inside of the zone capacity isn't 100% Right. So thanks for letting me put up this meme. Um, I think so. We did this we did this survey like a, an experimental survey where we give different people arguments against a hypothetical project near them. We say, oh, there's developer wants to build near you. And the neighbors are really worried there's going to be a lot of traffic. Do you support or oppose this project? And then we randomly change the argument against it. Developers want to build a building near you. The neighbors are really worried about like the strain on local schools and services. And we have neighborhood character is going to get ruined. And then the last argument was developer or developer is going to build something near you, and the developer has got a variance, and they're going to get rich. And that was the one, that elicited as much opposition as the it's going to ruin your neighborhood. Quite like the catch-all, it's going to destroy every character. So I think people hate developers. You know, the president is hated by many. I think, but there's a, it, Manville actually has an interesting paper about growth revolts and kind of how it's sort of planner's fault, right? We've made developers into what they are to some extent, and it's because we have increasingly relied on discretionary review. So every project is a five-year negotiated thing where the city's trying to get, and it's not a standard product that you just like build this product and you're done with it. It's a complicated process of negotiation which favors people with a lot of money, people that break the rules, people that negotiate hard, right? And so we've kind of created them in some sense. And I think one of the things that we're pushing is like turning housing development, making it boring, and like here's a standard product. You can build four-story apartment buildings everywhere. They're, they're kind of basically the same thing. The process to get it approved is really standardized. And then you could have like mom and pop developers that people don't hate doing it. I mean, I think when you get to a city like New York, I think every project to some extent gets more and more bespoke. And you need, like at some point you actually need process regulation because it's just a complicated thing to build a giant building, right? So um, I think that happens. And then you maybe are going to inevitably have something where I don't really know what happens. All I see is there's this big flashy building that's calling itself luxury. And I know someone's getting rich. And damn it, I'm mad about. And like, we're not mad at the oil. I mean, maybe we're mad at the oil execs. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to think of like other similarly bad people. We, I mean, we hate lawyers, but they're also kind of similarly in this negotiating kind of context. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a big issue. And I think planners, you know, we're part of the problem. And I think planners should, you know, so getting over our hatred of the growth machine and like being okay. I mean, no radical 25 year old wants to go advocate for like. Luxury apartment buildings in Santa Monica, 
to like help not gentrify East LA. But like actually that'd be a good thing to do. Um, it's just not exciting, I think. So making that exciting <laughs> would be useful. Uh, the other one, maybe I'll come back to it. Process, yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, thank you. Second of all, uh, two questions. How do you treat the unincorporated areas uh, governed by LA County? Right. And how would that data, or the lack of that data, play out in actual uh, the results? Yeah, so we just ignore them in this. Uh, in some, so LA County is huge and has like a, it's the, has like a million, more than a million unincorporated resi residents that are un living in unincorporated areas. And a lot of them are urban LA, but some of them are like towns in the north of LA County. We just include them. It's kind of too messy to include them, so we just exclude them. I don't think, I mean, the, the data points are cities in this, so if we added them, it would be 35, 40 more data points. I don't think it would make a big difference, but we should we should do something. We should think about that. There, there, there are some growth in going on. Uh, in yeah, there's a lot of growth. Well, I mean, and actually, if you look at this zone capacity number, uh, they're not in here. But a lot of like the region's zone capacity, unincorporated areas like carry more than their weight because they have a lot of empty land, right? Yeah. Though we also have affordable housing issues here, so mm -hmm. it's not I have two questions about um, both kind of related to supply. One, and I'm asking you because I don't know. I envision this these small, you know, kind of modest four-story buildings. You talked about mom and pop developers, and is there? And you think about immigrant-run businesses and mm -hmm. capital that's accumulated through small businesses. Right. Um, that sometimes you know, there might be a, a desire to put that into property development, turn one story line into a four story apartment building. Mm -hmm. Is there any of that going on in LA now? Is there any sort of uh, population of, of small developers that exist under the, 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 big, right. uh, the big corporate developers that might be, you, know, you could sort of enlist in this as a, as a more progressive kind of uh, project? And then the second one related to those big developers, uh, I think a, another part of the story is talking to them, right? And understanding like what they, how they see the market and how they see, um, uh, you know, they, they have their own plans and their own ideas of what's profitable, what's going to bring in return on investment. Uh, and I was wondering if you were ever if thinking about in this project doing any kind of interviews or kind right. of focus going to the developers and right. feedback developers and actually talking to them. <laughs> um, which might not be fun, but but still, I think there could be a lot of insight into how they think about this market. Like, right. If we have some four stories, would all of Los Feliz become four story apartments? Right. Because it's just demand waiting to, you know, right. it's just capacity waiting to be unleashed. Yeah, so those are both good points. Um, I would love for there to be like a vibrant mom and pop immigrant developer community of four story apartment buildings. It doesn't exist because, as I said, we don't build four story, they're not, you know, they're not legal anywhere. Where there are mom and pop developers in LA that are kind of developer contractors are people building really expensive single family houses. So we have a vibrant, like every, you know, there's a lot of tear down a 900 square foot bungalow, throw up a 3,000 square foot flashy single family home with a pool, and that's where the mom and pop, I mean, that's, I know a couple of them, and that's what they do. And some of them are in the world. Right, and so I think those, those people could be converted to the four-story building developers if those buildings were legalized, right? I mean, and it is interesting how you talk to the develop, I've talked to developers before, and I think that it's useful, but to some extent, the ones that exist are building really big projects, so they're not kind of the perspective you want. Um, not only that, they're the ones that say, the most important thing is process, CEQA, impact fees, right? They're really focused on the myopic kind of what's happening on my project. What don't I like are the, all the fees I have to pay. And they're never going to say, you know what? I've been thinking about like this big picture of making housing affordable and we should up some single. Like they don't care about that. They care about like their, uh, you know, their project. So it's interesting because when you talk like the Turner Center report on their survey pointed this out, like developers focus on process, uh, planners focus on like land availability basically, and that's kind of the contrast. But you know, there, you know, for the nuanced reform of 
different little things that's a useful perspective, uh, but less for the big picture. Yeah. Um, I have a question about like breaking down the difference between if, if in your research you're people's perceptions and such, if you've noticed any difference between how people will respond to density in terms of like square footage and density mm -hmm. in terms of units. Right. It seems like they're like you point to this that's the size of a four unit yeah. home, but it's a single family home. Or an eight so unit. Do you think that the reaction is primarily about size or is it about units? I and mean, is there a potential for like a grand bargain? Right. Like, where unit counts are allowed, but FAR Yeah, it's a good question. It's something people will definitely talk about. I think it's both. I mean, I think if you said, okay, single family neighbors, we're not going to allow more than two stories, but that 3,000 unit, 3,000 square foot building can now have six apartments in it. They would also not like that, right? So I think, you know, it's both. But I think the perception of density and the perception of uh, building booms is important, especially in LA. I don't think it's as true here, but as a person moving through the city of LA, you don't move through single family neighborhoods. So you don't realize just how much land is dedicated to single family neighborhoods, right? So you move through corridors and that's where we've put, that's where the only place we allow development to happen. So I think that is people do have a skewed understanding of how dense their city is. And it also causes a problem thinking there's a lot of development happening when, when really there's not. Yeah. I, I'm kind of curious what is the perception of people's, people's perception of risk of natural disasters in California. Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of how you kind of influence on the prohibitions against climate. Right. Yeah, people, someone has, some, one of my colleagues recently brought that up as like upzoning would be a problem because of natural disasters. But I think it's the opposite. I mean, so there's like a. The LA Times editorial board came out against SB 827, which was this first effort to, to force cities to allow tall buildings near, tra tall buildings near transit, four-story buildings near transit, eight-story buildings near transit. Um, the LA Times came out against it, but then later on, there's this thing called the Centennial Project, which is like a 40,000 home master plan community out in the middle of the Tejon Pat, like really in the middle of nowhere. And I talked to the woman that writes the editorials for the LA Times, and she said, yeah, this is really bad, right? We need housing, but we shouldn't be building a new 40,000 home city right in the middle of wildfire country. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's why we should have done the infill thing that you guys opposed the year before, right? I mean, I'm not sure, in terms of fires at least, I guess earthquakes or what, what was the natural disaster that we were, you were worried about? Getting out? Earthquakes. Sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the earthquake, I mean, the building codes for earthquakes in California are good. I trust them. They're, I mean, the, let's put it this way. Any new building is going to be way safer than the old buildings. I guess that people coming in from another country think that I see these houses built on wood. Right. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good point. I, I, it's not something really I've, I've really, I don't really know anything about it. Maybe it's dangerous. I know my building at UCLA is very earthquake prone and unsafe. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Right. Yep. Yeah, actually, we have a lot of, uh, there are a lot of historic neighborhoods in LA that were mansions and are now six unit apartment buildings. So we have in the city old fancy mansions that are, have been converted to, to, to that kind of housing. So it's definitely possible. I mean, it's better just to start out as apartments, but and I don't think you, I mean, the way the market works, you wouldn't ever convert something, like the brand new single family. I mean, part of the issue is also income inequality. So, in, you know, when we talk about mild upzoning, like let's allow duplexes or threeplexes. It's not clear to me that that would be effective. And San Francisco, Ted Egan had this interesting study about that uh, because 
if you can sell a new single family home for $1.8 million, you know, could you sell two condos for, for one million each? Like maybe not. Actually the economics of it might be, you know, there's a lot of very rich people, so this might actually be better. At least in the fancy neighborhoods. I'm not sure. You know, it's one of those things where we could worry about that happening or we could just like allow duplexes and see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really great question. I mean, I think that's a lot of people's first instinct, and it's a, a good instinct to have. Um, a couple, a couple points on that. Uh, well, I'll come to that in a second. One, one point is everybody hates new buildings, and they always have throughout history. So there's a great book you should all read since you are here in New York called "The Invention of Brownstone Brooklyn," especially the chapter about how when they built the brownstones, everyone hated them. They were so ugly and tacky and uh, horrible. And they were mom and pop developers also. I mean, that story is kind of what I think we should be repeating in LA. But then now, guess what? They're the most treasured, iconic, you know, and like people hated the Eiffel Tower and people hated the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So one thing is like whatever basically you build now, everyone's gonna hate it and in 100 years, they're gonna love it. But that's not the important thing, I think. Um, the important thing is this idea of, so two things. One thing is the buildings aren't for them and don't help lower income parts of the city. The other thing is induced demand. I think with the induced demand thing, it's a little easier to, to show that it's not a, not a real problem. You would have to kind of have like an endless supply of rich people not living in your metropolitan area that are all going to live in all the new buildings for that to be a problem. And that's just not what we observe, right? So in fact, when you build a new building, there's a great... Oh, yeah. I recommend everyone reading this paper. It's quite good uh, by a guy named Evan Mast. Basically, he looks at when, I, when you build a new expensive building, who lives in it, right? And he finds like a third of the people are from out of the metropolitan area. But a third of the people, the, the other two thirds are from that same city. A third of the people are from the rich neighborhood right around it. And so basically, they're just shuffling around in the rich neighborhood. But then there's a third of people that move into the brand new luxury building that are coming from a median income neighborhood. And then he traces back like what he calls a chain of migration. So then the people that move from the median income neighborhood into the expensive building, who moved into the building that they moved out of? And he finds that a lot of those people actually come from the next lowest income neighborhood. And so pretty quickly you get this chain of moves where building a new luxury building releases some of the demand for housing in the poorest neighborhoods of the city. So I think that's, I mean, basically that's the story, like the opposite of the story that I was telling where when Culver City adds a bunch of high-tech, high-paying jobs but doesn't add any housing, right? So the employees of those jobs don't live there, they live right there. The people that were living there have to live there and they get slowly pushed out into poorer and poorer neighborhoods. 
Um, I think that this is this idea about kind of the permeability of housing submarkets. But it's an important concern. Yeah, the difference between con induced demand and highways is real because highways aren't priced. Housing is priced. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because um, perhaps some of some people among us are not so um, um, do not don't have a background of right. um, learning housing or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So the basic idea. I think I had a picture that might help. I had another better picture by looking out. I think this one maybe. I mean, so basically. Uh, in the US, the zoning development standards say for every parcel, how tall can the building be? How many, what's the setbacks? How close to the edge? What's the FAR, et cetera? They set the rules about what can be built. And upzoning is the idea that you increase the allowable density. So moving from, you know, you can build one unit on 5,000 square feet to you can build 10 units on 5,000 square feet. Yeah. All right, we're done. One more, uh, one more picture, then I'll really quit. Sorry. Uh, this is really good. You should check out these maps by E.C. Roman. Whoa. So basically, he looks at census tracts in the L.A. region. He does this for all the cities in the U.S. You should check out buildzoom.com. Blah, blah, blah. This is kind of what I was talking about. In most of the city, we're building nothing. What does get built is large buildings, basically. Cool. Thanks very much. Thank